Okay, so, all right, uh, thank you. So uh, thank you everyone. So uh, my name is uh, Xiaokun Yang. Uh, I'm from the University of Houston Clear Lake, uh, which is one campus from the University, uh, University of Houston system. Uh, so totally we have uh, 9,000 students, so 6,000 about the uh, uh, undergrad uh, level and uh, 3,000 for the graduate level. So uh, we are a small uh, university. And uh, in this uh, summer intern, I have two students work with me, uh, Mario and Ben. Uh, and our LBL collaborators uh, or mentors are uh, Doro and uh, Nemo. Uh, and uh, our joint chef is uh, our supervisor. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the uh, appreciation for the support from the WDTS uh, under the uh, VFP program. And also I would like to thank uh, our um, supervisor, Dr. John Shelf, uh, and our mentors, Doro and uh, uh, Nemo. So uh, that's uh, very important for our students to learn a lot of things during the internship. So thanks for the support. Uh, my, uh, my topic is uh, based on uh, many of uh, the sections. So first of all, I'm going to go over the questions, then the methods, uh, the results, outcomes, then uh, some of uh, the experience we have. Uh, finally, is uh, the impact. So let's start. So uh, as you may know, like the moon law is going to the end uh, uh, because of uh, the limitation from the physical level device uh, under two nanometers. Uh, so there were many existing solutions uh, for continued uh, computation speed. So the improvement of uh, the computation speed uh, never stopped. So design specialization is one of uh, the immediate options. Uh, so the uh, examples are Google TPU, Facebook, Big Sur, and many of uh, the other IPG accelerators. Uh, so all of those applications are uh, economic uh, incentive. Uh, however, for the scientific computing, uh, it's less of for such a for the incentive, so it runs the risk of being left behind. Under this content, uh, context, uh, we propose our project as uh, the dense functional theory design uh, with uh, the uh, pure hardware, uh, with uh, the Verilog design and IPG acceleration. So finally, uh, our uh, ideal goal is uh, to tip out uh, uh, application-specific ASIC. Uh, so the dense functional theory uh, takes uh, about 25% of uh, the workload uh, at the supercomputing centers uh, from uh, such as uh, the NERSC at the LBL uh, center. So that's uh, the motivation of us to implement the same uh, algorithm based on the pure hardware accelerator. So the acceleration on the DFT has a great potential to improve the performance. Uh, like we, our expectation is based on 100% uh, times uh, speed up. Uh, so generally, the, D, uh, the DFT has uh, multiple uh, uh, sub-algorithms. So uh, the crucial one is 3D FFT. So, uh, so the, the entire project uh, is planned over three years. And uh, in the first term, uh, our plan is to make the 3D uh, FFT, three-dimensional FFT design. Uh, so our work uh, is uh, mainly compared with uh, the uh, results from the Spiro generator, uh, which is from the uh, CMU, uh, it's open source. So I'm not, I'm not going to go to too much details of the project. Uh, I just uh, briefly uh, introduced about how we work on the project. So uh, our design is mainly based on the two uh, formulas. Uh, so the first one is based on the uh, radius of R. So as long as we can represent the, the length of FFTSR to the power of T, uh, we are able to generate the design. Uh, and the second one, so uh, the spiral design is mainly based on the first uh, formula, uh, which is the R should be two. So any uh, number of uh, the power of two can be generated with uh, the, uh, with the, the spiral generator. So our work uh, extend the, the project into um, the second one, so mixed FFT. Uh, so for the second formula, we are able to generate the hardware structure with uh, the R to the K times uh, S to the L. So ideally we are able to have uh, any size of FFT. Uh, so with uh, the basic configurations. Uh, so the design flow is shown in the figure three. Uh, so first of all, we use uh, the Chiso HCL to uh, design the generator for the one dimensional FFT. Uh, then based on the one dimensional FFT, we make it as an IP. So we uh, instantiate the one dimensional uh, design into two dimensional, yeah, finally the three dimensional uh, designs with uh, the Verilog HDL. So the final step is uh, the evaluation. We use uh, the IPG synthesis to evaluate the performance in terms of uh, uh, maximum operational frequency and uh, the chip area and the power consumption. Uh, 
so by the way, the Chisel HCL is uh, uh, one of uh, the uh, programming language uh, designed, uh, created and maintained by the Berkeley lab. So here is uh, the one dimensional FFT design. Uh, so instead of uh, one of uh, the uh, design structure, we propose many uh, different design, design options uh, with uh, different streaming widths. So um, if uh, the streaming width is uh, larger, so we are able to have a higher throughput, uh, however, like less of for the, uh, however, uh, it's, it's going to be a larger area. So if uh, the stream width is uh, less, so we will have a, a, a smaller chip area, but uh, the, the, the throughput is, uh, uh, is going to be uh, less. So it depends on the design applications and the design specifications uh, with uh, different generated results. So in table one, we show uh, the uh, latency and the resource cost for different uh, stream widths. Uh, then based on the one-dimensional design, uh, we implement the uh, two-dimensional FFT uh, based on the lens of 196. Uh, so uh, first of all, we use uh, the uh, one-dimensional FFT uh, as a, so we reuse uh, the one-dimensional FFT as uh, the iterative design structure. Uh, so we use it two ones for making the uh, input and output uh, from, the, uh, from the real domain to the frequency domain. Uh, so the downside is, uh, the input cannot be streaming in and out uh, because uh, the uh, input data must uh, wait until the uh, first dimensional FFT finish. So it's going to be a gap between the uh, two matrix input, so uh, which is not our ex uh, meet our expectation. So we propose another uh, improved design. So uh, using the streaming design. So uh, uh, instantiate the uh, one dimensional FFT to ones uh, with uh, the permutation uh, between of uh, between the two uh, one dimensional FFT, we are able to make the input in parallel as well as the pipeline the input and output. So uh, we call it a streaming structure. Uh, so based on this structure, uh, we can see the uh, although like it takes more uh, hardware resource, but the latency uh, can be reduced. So on top of that, we implement the the last, uh, uh, our research goal with uh, the three-dimensional FFT, uh, the lens as uh, 96. Uh, so at the bottom, that's uh, the design structure. We have a uh, three one-dimensional uh, FFT 96, uh, and uh, we have the permutation, uh, which is memory write and read to make the output transpose uh, to, to the cubic. So the input will be a cubic, the output will be a cubic. Uh, so we also have uh, different streaming ways. Uh, the, High, uh, the wider of the streaming width, uh, the more resource cost, but the latency can be reduced as well. So it depends on our uh, design specification or design constraints. So the final results, so uh, we compared the one dimensional FFT hour design with uh, the Sparrow design. Uh, so for example, the 128 uh, uh, lens of the design, uh, it, it can be improved by 7.16 uh, uh, times uh, speed up uh, based on the number of clock cycles. And uh, uh, based on the Sparrow design generator, it doesn't, uh, it, it is uh, impossible to have uh, any size of streaming FFT. So for our design, uh, so for example, like we can make the two to the power of five and three uh, power of one uh, to implement the FFT 96. So any size of streaming FFT can be generated based on our uh, generator. Uh, then on top of that, so two-dimensional FFT, of, uh, and also like we are able to make the uh, the prime number of uh, FFT, which is important for the quantum uh, circuit simulation. So 2D FFT performance, uh, uh, 18 microsecond to 0.3 uh, milliseconds for the two-dimensional FFT based on our design. Uh, Three-dimensional FFT, uh, uh, we have a 2.2 millisecond to 35 milliseconds for the cubic uh, transform. So that's uh, the uh, final results, uh, which is very fast for the simulation. So the outcome and the future work. So uh, we are planning to have a first paper uh, uh, submission uh, based on the current results we have. And also we are planning to have uh, an external ground uh, or proposal writing for the next year. Uh, so the final goal will be a standalone ASIC. Uh, so we are considering about the TSMC uh, 16 or 28 nanometers technology for TP on the chip is uh, uh, maybe three years work. So for the future works, uh, so right now we only have the three dimensional FFT uh, 
And uh, to finish about the final um, dense functional theory, it, it also needs the TSQR axioms, uh, matrix multiplication axioms. Uh, so the future work will be uh, different IP designs uh, finally integrated as uh, an SOC. And also before we spend uh, 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 maybe less than $1 million to tip out the chip, we also need to do the IPG demonstration and prototype. So here's our future work. Experience and story. So uh, the main challenge for our uh, group is uh, we don't have the PhD students uh, to keep a long term of the research plan. Uh, so that's uh, the main challenge we have uh, to overcome the challenge, uh, my experience here, to, to be well prepared uh, before we start the project. So uh, for example, our, our summer intern takes uh, in the summer, but we start the project um, in, the, in the spring. And in last of all, we already get the training for the GISO language, Verilog, uh, HDL language for the students. Be prepared uh, before we start the projects. So that, that is my experience for uh, training the students or guide the students. And also in the future, we may think about to, uh, to looking for the external funding for the support of uh, maybe a postdoc or PT student to uh, as a three years projects, uh, it is a must. Then the conclusion and the impact, what is my research about? The uh, research is mainly to implement the design specialization for the dense functional theory uh, with uh, the final ASIC uh, uh, standalone chip. And uh, my research impact, uh, it is expected to provide 100 times of the speed up for the DFT related uh, uh, computation at uh, the NERSC uh, Super Computing Center. So making the simulations or research uh, based on the uh, material science chemistry uh, and the physics uh, practical uh, to the DOE program. So that's uh, our uh, VIP impact. Okay, reference. And I may take any questions you have. Thanks for your listening. You all can unmute yourselves and ask questions or put them in the chat if you would prefer not to speak. Any questions for Dr. Yang? Um, I got a little bit lost. Um, so the this new uh, this new transform, right? So the FFT already exists, which is faster than the Fourier transform, and so it's this new one that you're. Uh, kind of putting together for for nurse, is that going to be a hundred times faster than the FFT or a hundred times faster than the original transform? So right now the uh, FFT is mainly running on the uh, CPU or GPU uh, at NERSC, and we are trying to implement the pure hardware design using the digital logic, so AND gate or gates to implement the uh, higher speed of uh, the three uh, D FFT. And we try to find some, some existing uh, FFT generators, uh, which is open source by, by the other university, like the uh, Sparrow from CMU. Uh, however, like they only support the, the generation based on the FFT size of uh, power of two. So we can generate the uh, two, four, eight, 16. Uh, but for our, our design, we can generate any size of for the FFT. So our uh, results, uh, uh, our so so the the FFT less we need is the uh, ninety six, which is not able to be generated. And another thing is that we uh, we improve the hardware design, uh, the design structure with uh, faster bus protocols uh, interface, and also uh, the floating point designs. So we are able to make seven point one uh, times uh, speed up based on the uh, generated results from Sparrow. So the most important thing is we have for the 96 dense uh, of the design for, for, the, for the code. Uh, the main contribution is that it's going to be an uh, ASIC or IPG uh, accelerator. So. Gotcha, thank you. Oh. Any other questions? Okay, moving right along to our second presenter, which will be Cynthia Trevisan. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Yang, if you can unshare the, your screen so that Cynthia can share. Thank you. Thank you, Nakia. And thank you for that uh, great presentation. 
I'm going to see if I can get my presentation up and running. Just one second. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think I'm ready. Okay, why can't I see this? Is this it? Let's let's see. You tell me if. if can you see my uh, title slide there? We can. Yeah, we oh, see perfect. the screen okay. too, but that's okay. We, we do see the rest of your screen as well. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. So let's see if I can unshare and try again. Uh, let's see. How about now? Perfect. Okay, great. Got it. <laughs> Sorry for the hiccup there. And okay, I'm ready to get started. Uh, well, uh, thank you everybody for being here. My name is Cynthia Trevisan. I'm a professor of physics at Cal Maritime. I'm not going to talk about Cal Maritime because my colleague and friend Frank Yip already did a wonderful time describing our campus. So I'm going to go straight to, first of all, acknowledging the other people on this slide who are my collaborators here. In particular, I'd like to mention uh, Robert Lucchese, who is my mentor, and he's uh, the person who got our entire group steered towards uh, studying time delays, which is something new for us and uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So let me tell you a little bit about why we're doing this. We, uh, as a mankind, really, scientists for the longest time, have been wanting to see what happens inside molecules. For instance, how does a chemical reaction occur in real time? Right. In order to do that, we need, uh, just like in high-speed photography, one would need to, uh, for to make in order to make a molecular movie, would, we would need to record images with a shutter speed that is faster than the motion of the objects of interest. How do we do that with a molecule? Well, we need very, very short pulses of light. Right. Uh, that would act as a stroboscope. We don't have a mechanical shutter in this case. Uh, and what what? How short is short, right? So that's the next question. So what I have here is a uh, characteristic time scales. These are numbers are so small that it re it's very hard to wrap your mind around, right? So if you look at uh, at this at the screen now, I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor. There are biological processes in the time scales that those take. Femtosecond uh, time scales, 10 to the negative 15 seconds, is approximately what you know the, an infrared, a uh, few of these, an infrared laser pulse will, will, will uh, time scales associated with that. But if we try to illuminate a molecule with an infrared uh, pulse, we'll just see a big blur, right? So we need to do better. We need to get into this addo second regime, 10 to the negative 18 seconds. That's the time scale that we need in order to see electrons in a molecule. Right nowadays, that is possible. How is that? How does that happen? It happens through a conversion of infrared laser light into uh, through a process that is called high harmonic generation. And just to illustrate it with this cartoon, you can see this uh, yellow curve here representing the cy a cycle of laser light. Right, and what happens here is that a uh, number of atoms or, or molecules are put in this field, and what happens is when this is at its peak, it pulls out the most uh, least bound electrons from this atom, for instance, it accelerates it away. And when this comes down to its uh, minimum, the, the electron that was uh, had gained some energy away from its parent ion is a accelerates back and re-collisions with the parent ion. In doing so, it releases uh, high energy photons. As these are soft X-rays. And that's how we get into this attosecond regime. So nowadays, 100 attosecond pulses are routine. Right? What do we do with that? Well, we measure time delays. What are time delays? What are they used for? Well. I have a cartoon here to illustrate that. Imagine that this little orange mountain represents an electron and you'd say, yeah, electrons are particles. Sure, they're particles, but in the, in the world of the very small, uh, things not only have, uh, they're not, that's not quite right, right? So, because there's a nature associated with this, a, a, a wave nature rather, uh, associated with these particles, right? So these here uh, have this shape because they re represent wave packets. And this is a cartoon that's representing the time it takes this uh, electron to go from point A to point B, where we have a detector waiting for it to catch it, right? There's nothing in its way. This is a free electron, and it's going to be used as a reference. 
this other electron here uh, is also going from point A to point B where the detector is, but there's something in its way. So this is a potential, uh, this is something that interferes with it. It could slow it down, it could speed it up. In this particular case, it's speeding it up. And so this uh, difference in time is a time delay. Right, and uh, it has to do uh, with uh, what we are measuring and what information that's going to give us about what's going on inside of a molecule. All right, I'm going to move on to the next slide, and this looks a little bit scary and a little bit technical, but uh, I'm just going to uh, throw all the constants and all the technicalities under the rug here, and I'm going to say, okay, we're trying to describe nature at a very small scale, and we may have heard that uh, this has to do with, uh, quantum mechanics has to do with probabilities, and that's all true and fine, but it doesn't have to do just with probabilities. It's also about probability amplitudes, right? And so what are probability amplitudes? Well, you can see these equations here uh, that are representing uh, the probability amplitudes are connected to the probability of ejection, the probability of ionization that we could measure just fine be be before uh, attosecond science. But now with attosecond science, we can go a little bit deeper. We can measure these amplitudes and these amplitudes are complex quantities that have a phase. And remember how I mentioned that uh, there's a wave nature to these uh, subatomic particles, right? And, and the phase will give you some idea of how maybe these are, uh, you know, in a, in a very, very uh, rudimentary picture, how, how these, for instance, shift left to right. But what uh, the, the important part is that when these amplitudes combine to make these wave packets, right, whose centers move like a particle, right? It is a phase that matters, right? They determine where the particle is, how fast it moves, they, and, and they determine the time delays, right? So that's what we, uh, that is now possible to measure. So uh, time delays can be measured for both photoionization and photo detachment. I'm going to show you what these things are, uh, these processes are. Uh, they are uh, half scattering processes, not like the one you just saw, right? Because here the electron is born within the molecule. So what is the difference between photoionization and photo detachment, which is the two uh, processes that we're focused on? In photoionization, we start out with a neutral molecule. That's what this A represents. It, uh, there's an, uh, a photon or a particle of light that interacts with that molecule. And when after that happens, there's a positive ion and an electron that is the product of this interaction, right? In photo detachment, it's pretty much the same thing, except that uh, for our starting point, we start out with a negative ion. So when this interaction occurs, we are left with this neutral molecule and this electron, okay? Now there's a difference between these two processes and um, most uh, experiments in theory up to, until now has focused on this photoionization. The first one I showed that started out with a neutral molecule, right? Uh, now there's a problem with that, and that is that the there are many interesting uh, electron molecule interactions, very interesting features that happen at pretty low energies, right? And when we're studying photoionization, those the low energies what what the signatures that these things can leave at low energies gets washed out because of, uh, well, this is a little bit technical again, but because of uh, how we, um, we can measure and compute these uh, time delays, th they d diverge at low energy. So we can't really see these features. An example of one of these features is a resonance. What is a resonance? A resonance is a metastable state, a temporary state, that has a lifetime associated with it. And it's a state in which an electron will hang out for a while, right? It sticks for a while before it leaves, right? So these things leave um, signatures in, in what are called cross sections. And if uh, you have times and questions, I can tell you a little bit more about what a cross section is, but it leaves these like these little bumps here. So these are uh, examples of two molecules that uh, for which uh, photo, uh, ionization has been studied, but when we look at the low energies, these resonances, we don't have any signature or maybe a very small one here, but it's very hard to, to connect. Uh, same thing here for low energies, these time delays, which is the bottom row, diverge. This is uh, 
this now here is an idea that was born within this group and has is, we're really just getting started with this there's not much experiments on photo detachment right so this is an example of a molecule that starts out as a negative ion and computing the um uh the cross sections and the time delays right this is a cross section this is a time delay you see this resonance this hump this feature survives because of uh, because this is photo detachment and not photo ionization. And this is another example of that, right? Right now we're studying ozone, uh, the ozone anion uh, for the same thing, right? The resonance is an example, but we have other uh, electron molecule features that can leave signatures in these, in these uh, studies. And this is for instance, a molecule that has a dipole moment, right? A dipole moment is an area in the molecule that uh, a region that is like more attractive or more repulsive to an electron. And so uh, when these are uh, our calculations, our theory, and we see all these, these beautiful things, right? These features, and we're still trying to map this up with, uh, okay, is this a resonance? Is this a signature of, of a dipole moment? What does this mean, right? There's no experimental work done on this yet, but this is how we can uh, advance this, this field, right? And then we're suggesting experiments and seeing what happens and seeing if we can put together that Rosetta Stone. This is my summary slide. There are a few technical points that I put up here uh, of what we learned this summer. Uh, but to uh, uh, emphasize the two points that Makia asked me to include in this conclusion slide is, what is this research about? In very general terms, we are working on advancing the development of theoretical and computational tools to interpret and predict the outcome of experiments, for instance, that track chemical reactions in real time, right? That's a, that's a goal. Uh, how does this research impact others? Well, for one thing, it provides guidance and interpretation to experiments that are taking place nowadays. And of course, has the potential of suggesting new ex experiments. Uh, it will be one of the themes uh, for research that the Atomic Molecular and Optical Science Group is going to include in its uh, next review. And ultimately, although this may sound very abstract and, and disconnected to our everyday life, it is what makes the building blocks, the foundations of, of, of our current day technology, right? This is what fundamental science is all about. Without it, we wouldn't be on Zoom today, right? Without AMO science. So, so this is all I have for you. I'd like to thank the organizers of, um, of, of this uh, internship of Bluff of BFP, uh, all the hard work you put in every day. And I'd like to thank everybody for being here. I'm open for questions. Any questions for Cynthia? You can go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Okay, thank you so much, Cynthia. I guess you did a great job at presenting since there's no question. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> now we'll move on to our final presenter for today which is Dr. Zhang. Dr. Zhang, could you please share your screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone, uh, I'm Xue Chen Zhang. Uh, so I'm a social professor from Washington State University, Vancouver. And we are part of the uh, Washington State University Systems. And uh, this campus is uh, outside uh, um, Portland, Oregon. And we have about 3,500 students uh, on this campus. So today I'm going to uh, present uh, our project uh, PMIO, uh, High Performance Precision Memory Aware Collective IO Framework for Parallel Applications. And this is a project in collaboration uh, with uh, lab scientists from Scientific Data Management Group, John Wu and uh, Surin Bainer. And also um, I'm working with uh, my students, Keegan and Alex on this project during the summer. Um, so the problem uh, we are trying to um, um, resolve is about uh, uh, IO performance of HPC uh, system high performance computing clusters. So uh, we know that HPC applications tend to generate uh, a large amount of data, like uh, uh, this combustion application can generate uh, uh, five, five terabytes data per run. 
And this particle accelerator can generate uh, over five, uh, 15 petabytes of data per year. And also because uh, you know we have millions of cores and we need to run uh, multiple applications concurrently. So the system has to be uh, designed to handle very high IO concurrency. And uh, one of the um, famous optimization uh, for improving I performance is called uh, collective IO. So the idea, the basic idea is to trans transform many small non-contiguous IO requests to large contiguous IO requests. So this figure show you an example. Uh, let's say this is the uh, uh, domain access by process uh, one. This is domain access by process two. Uh, so you can see uh, this uh, a domain are not a contiguous in the uh, process user buffer. And uh, uh, so this is the one, and the next to this one is uh, is accessed by process two, and uh, um, the next location accessed by uh, access is from process three. So in order to make uh, uh, you know disk performance or IO system performance better, uh, we can use collective IO, which will merge this request. So this is uh, uh, this requires a global uh, communication on the computer nodes, and uh, uh, so after getting the uh, the request list from all the processes, we can calculate uh, you know. Uh, uh, a contiguous file domain and then assign each contiguous file domain to process. So for example, after uh, exchanging the metadata, we know that we can issue this large request and uh, these are contiguous requests to disk and we can ask uh, process one to issue this request, for example, and then we ask process two to issue this contiguous large request to disk. And by, by doing this, we can uh, significantly improve the performance of uh, uh, HPC storage system. And of course, after, you know, uh, and if we want to do read, then you know uh, after exchanging the metadata, we have to uh, uh, read data from this to this collective IO buffer, and then you know send this data uh, back to each processes that uh, uh, that request this data. And uh, um, based on our experiments, we find this global communication is the uh, system bottleneck. And uh, uh, one parameter that determines the uh, communication frequency and granularity of uh, IO requests is the size of this collective IO buffer. So um, because uh, the memory size is very limited on, on supercomputers, and so uh, we want to um, use very small collective IO buffer you know, to do this collective IO just to reduce the pressure on the computer node, right? Uh, so then our uh, research focus on, um, you know, how about uh, uh, if we can use a large collective IO buffer? And then we start with this question. Uh, so we run a number of experiments uh, using different benchmarks like uh, MPI tile IO and the non contig uh, uh, with different uh, uh, configuration. And so we can see that uh, if we increase the collective IO buffer size, um, then we can significantly improve the uh, IO performance of HPC applications. Right, and this is because again, small collective IO buffer leads to more communication overhead and more IOs on disk, and that will reduce the performance. So then the idea is, how can we can we increase the collective IO buffer size? Uh, but the, the the problem with this approach is we're gonna increase the memory pressure, right? So we know the per core DRAM capacity is decreasing on supercomputers. So um, the uh, collective IO buffer in the MPH library, uh, you know, explicitly mentioned that we should be very conservative when using DRAM for collective IO. And also, if we use a very large buffer, uh, you know, we may end up losing the data because supercomputers are not uh, uh, very uh, it are failure. Um, uh, tentative, so we may we may see computer node failure is a norm on uh, supercomputers. So uh, can we solve this problem by using persistent memory? And uh, persistent memory is a new type of emerging story devices. So you probably know DRAM and flash, right? Which flash are the basic components of a solid state disk that you use every day. So a new emerging storage device is called persistent memory, like uh, um, you know OptinDim from Intel, and uh, the performance of present memory is close to DRAM and its cost is decreasing and it is uh, uh, a non-volatile mean, meaning you don't lose data and uh, and this is similar to flash based SSD, right? But on DRAM, you're going to lose data. And it is also byte addressable. And more importantly, it is very power efficient. So we think present memory is the, uh, the technology that we should use to replace uh, DRAM. Uh, 
Okay, so we want to replace, uh, we want to design collective buffer using present memory. And uh, if we simply replace it uh, using a strongman approach, uh, we can, we didn't achieve very good performance. And uh, after, not, after analyzing the results, we find that uh, this is because uh, the existing design doesn't uh, uh, issue sequential rights to present memory. And uh, if you don't issue sequential rights to present memory, then you are not going to achieve high bandwidth of present memory. And also, uh, we only record data in the uh, collective L buffer. So there's no way that you can, uh, you know, guarantee cross crash consistency, uh, meaning you cannot recover data, right? Even though your data is uh, uh, is non-volatile on present memory. And also uh, still communication is the bottleneck, uh, uh, just simply replacing DRAM with uh, present memory, you are not going to address this communication bottleneck eff uh, effectively. So um, in this project, we uh, propose to design a new uh, you know, collective IO uh, approach called uh, uh, PM Aware Collective IO or PMIO. And uh, the, the general idea is we want to redesign this buffer with log structure, uh, um, you know, layout. So, um, so you can see in this uh, collective uh, buffer, we have uh, both metadata uh, log and the data log, right? So for each request issued from processes, you're gonna uh, record it, uh, you go, you're gonna record it as, uh, its metadata in this metadata log. So this uh, this metadata including the, um, you know, uh, buffer offset in the uh, D log and also the file offset to be accessed and the request size, something like that, right? And then we divide this chunk, we divide this log buffer into chunks for uh, the convenience of garbage collection. And then we have another separate uh, data log. So all the data are recorded in the in the uh, data log. And uh, so by just by using this log structure, we think the data are recoverable because my data are recorded. And also uh, since we only append data to this log, so um, we can uh, leverage the high performance of sequential arrays. And this is uh, another picture show you the buffer layout uh, in present memory. So in uh, in this design, we use two-phase merging and to make sure that there is no uh, data shuffling on computer nodes. So uh, finally, um, we did a, a preliminary study uh, using a, a, a Kamas cluster, at, Kamas cluster at WSU, and we see that uh, you know uh, with different uh, uh, benchmarks, uh, we can improve the F throughput by up to uh, forty times compared to the one with. Um, uh, a DRAM buffer or naive uh, Strawman uh, approach using present memory. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, my research is about to optimize uh, collective I/O performance using present memory, and uh, uh, my research will uh, address the fundamental I/O bottleneck in uh, HPC system, and uh, this will uh, again uh, impact on the performance of uh, uh, I/O intensive workloads like checkpointing, like uh, data intensive uh, uh, applications. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for your uh, attention. Any questions? Any questions, anyone? Okay, thank you so much. Before I let you all go, um, I would like to thank you all for a great summer. And also I wanted to remind you that checkout appointments have already been scheduled for tomorrow morning. You should see that on your calendar. Please be sure to review the checkout page and make sure that all of your assignments and deliverables are complete. And if you are actually working on site, don't forget to meet with Julio tomorrow to drop off your badges in the cafeteria. He'll be available from 10 to 12 and 1 to 4, Julio? Exactly. Okay. Thank you all for your time. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you.